Heartland Highways is made possible in part by Consolidated Communications, offering customers high-speed internet, phone service, and digital TV service packages that include high-definition channels, DVR, and hundreds of sports, movies, and music channels. More information on these services available at Consolidated.com. Next on Heartland Highways, we'll travel to Kansas, Illinois to meet a man whose love for old school bicycles has turned into a unique business. Fat Tire Bicycles specializes in motorizing bikes. Then we'll travel to the Chanute Air Museum, a place we visited back in 2002. A lot has changed since then, so we'll bring you up to speed with what's new and talk to the people who restore the museum's aircraft. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Finally, we'll launch into a story about a model rocket club in central Illinois. Um, one of the things that makes, um, uh, distinguishes model rocketry versus, you know, amateur rocketry, perhaps, you'd call it, or experimental, is that all of the motors we use are commercially manufactured and have been certified. Don't go away, we've got a great show for you this week. For this week's show, we're coming to you from O'Brien Field here at Eastern. Now, this field is home to many Panther athletes, but most notable would include Cowboys quarterback Tony Romo and NFL coaches Mike Shanahan, Brad Childress, and Sean Payton. While it's quiet here today, on game day, this stadium and the surrounding area is a sea of Panther fans wearing, of course, Panther blue. Now there are two people who spend a lot of time at this stadium and not just on game day. That's our colleagues Fred Peralta and Ramin Carbacion. That's because they're responsible for the live broadcast and video board production for all EIU football and basketball games. If he wants, he's going to throw it. He's got a man wide open. Graves, touchdown, Eastern Illinois. Graves was running off his fumble, and Eastern has recovered at the 27-yard line. They tried to hand it to Jimmy Blair. He never had the football. Looks to me like but when they're not doing that, they do help us out on Heartland Highways. That's right, and for our first adventure, Ramin takes us to Kansas, Illinois, to meet Gary Kaplan, the owner of the Fat Tire Bicycle Shop. Everybody's got to do something, this is what I do. I lace wheels, I build custom wheels, I've been doing bicycles for 40 years. Uh, it's a passion of mine, I enjoy what I do. Gary Kaplan has lived in Kansas, Illinois for about 13 years. For the past two and a half years, he's been rebuilding bikes. Not motorcycles, but bicycles. I had this army bike I'm building here, I just got through building one, it sold last Sunday. And I felt like the guy was driving off with one of my kids. <laughs> I waited as it went by. I get it honestly because my brothers are hot rod guys. I got two older brothers who are hot rod guys and they always put stuff together. And I was around that growing up. I do hot rod stuff, it's just bicycles. You know, I, I try to bring that to what I built. Uh, I tell people every day that well, uh, just because we live in the Corn Belt don't mean we can't have cool stuff. Kaplan's love for hot rods and bicycles bring a sense of nostalgia to his fat tires bicycle shop. He says what he does brings it all back to when motorcycles were first built. You got a motor on a bicycle with a clutch and a brake. It don't get no better than that as far as the, being pure to the bicycle business and the motorcycles. That's where it all began. Kaplan says he's also been influenced by the Wright brothers. Is that era in time, the Wright brothers, uh, the design of the motorcycles, the first cars, that, that period of time just amazes me what those guys did with the technology and the abilities they had. The Wright brothers are just awesome in what they did. Uh, if you get into them and really, and really study 
exactly what they did. Uh, they had to design their own motors. Um, they did a lot of things for that period of time. It just, <coughs> I'm very impressed with. By the end of 2009, Kaplan has built and sold 35 motorized bikes. And it hasn't been easy along the way. There's a lot to building them. They're not easy to build. I've had four or five guys buy the kits and attempt to put them on themselves and they bring them to me because uh, the rear wheel's tricky on them and you gotta know what you're doing on them. I learned the hard way. I built enough of them where I, I learned. And like I say, that prototype I built, I, be, I beat the hell out of it just to see what it was gonna do. So I, I enjoy people coming in and telling me their stories about their bicycles. Everybody's got a story about when they were a kid and had a bicycle. And a lot of what I do is putting them old bikes back together. I've got one in there now that's uh, a guy's grandmother's that her brother stole the fenders off before World War II. And he brought it to me, he wants the fenders put back on it and bring it back to life. And that's what I, that's what I do. My day's off, I ride. I go to all the small towns in the area, they got little restaurants in them, I go have lunch. You get these things out on the country roads, they just, to me it's what it's all about, you know. Uh, you're enjoying the wind, you're smelling, it's, it's just gorgeous outside. These power assisted bicycles cruise at 25 miles per hour and can be ridden as fast as 33 miles per hour. Kaplan says they are the perfect ride on a country road. 150 miles to a gallon. Uh, they're fun to ride is, is the big thing with them. You don't have to have a driver's license, you don't have to insure them. They're a poor man's hot rod. You can get on these things and ride them all day long for $10. Kaplan started working on bicycles back in the 70s. He got started by working on Schwinn bicycles, which like several other American bicycles, have been bought out by foreign bike manufacturers. Kaplan says there's nothing better than an old school, cushy seated, white wall tire bike. They just look like the old bikes, and that's what I'm after. I like the old style look, the full fendered bicycle. Uh, one gear, you pedal backwards, you got a brake. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's what people are going back to, too. Uh, even the kids don't, don't like the 10 speeds no more of the mountain bikes. And, and honestly, the, at that price range, they just they go back quick because of the gears on them and the cables and the whole deal. Kaplan mainly builds adult bikes because he can't compete with the price of 10-speed bikes, which children ride. Kaplan says he's built bikes for special needs kids and has even built some three-wheelers. They're billboards. Uh, they bring people right to my door because you don't see very many of them around. In the last estimate, I was told there's only 3,500 original ones left in the United States. But one guy out in California doing reproductions, but it's not the same. Um, it brings people in, just like the, uh, the rat rod with the great big California handlebars. Uh, half the guys I sell my stuff to are bike guys because it's just another toy for to play with. Kaplan says he is content with staying small. He likes the size of his shop, which used to be a pool hall. He likes to take his time on each bike and says a bike a week is just fine with him. I could throw one together in two days, but that's not what I want to do. You know, that, that's not me. That's, people who buy from me or come in and, and, and work with me, uh, they know that if I say something and something's going on, we take care of it. You know, if, if I have to replace it or I have to relace it or whatever it ha has to be done, that's a big part of what I do is the service that I do. Uh, I want to be old school. When you come in here and shake my hand, and give me your word, I'm going to give it back, and that's, that's the way I want it. If I build and sell one a week, I'm happy with that. I don't, I don't, I've had guys ask me if I want to get bigger, and if I wanted to build more of these. And I don't want to do that. There's, there's a lot to be said for staying in a small shop. I want people to walk in here and say, this is old school. This is the way the shops used to be, and that's what I'm about. Whether they're cool or not, I, I, I do them. I enjoy them. So. I say everybody's got to do something. This is what I do. In this next story, we're headed to a place where stories and history of aviation are celebrated every day. Fred Peralta takes us to the Chanute Air Museum in Rantoul, Illinois. In 1988, the Air Force decided to close the Air Force training facility in Rantoul, Illinois. And while they couldn't keep the base, the people of Rantoul had other ideas. I got a request from the mayor uh, to head up a committee to save the airplanes with the idea being that a museum had to have the airplanes here 
to uh, be enough of an attraction. And that's where it kind of got started. What got started was the Chanute Air Museum, a venue dedicated to celebrate several aspects of this region's ties to aviation history, including its namesake, Octave Chanute. The legacy of Octave Chanute, who a lot of people don't know much about, but was quite a early aviation pioneer contributor. I like to say he was the Wright brothers' mentor, and even to the point where they asked him what kind of wood to put in their, their initial uh, airplane that flew at Kitty Hawk, so he was uh, quite influential. The museum occupies a large building in the old Air Force base, a base with a long history of service. The uh, base was established in 1917. Uh, matter of fact, August 1st, 1917 was when the uh, facility was officially accepted by the Army Signal Corps, as it was called back then. And its uh, initial mission was uh, training uh, pilots. And uh, matter of fact, they trained 110 pilots uh, that flew in World War I before the war actually ended. Then we have the, uh, the mission to, uh, of Chinook Field and the Chinook Air Force Base and the technical training that went on here. Uh, while the early days they didn't keep very good numbers, but we estimate that between 2.5 and 3 million students went through the facility. We also have, of course, military aviation history, and then we look at the Illinois aviation history, and that's really the, the exhibit that we're standing in now uh, was dedicated to those uh, Illinois aviation pioneers who contributed an awful lot to keeping the airplane viable. One of the most important moments in our country's military and social history is commemorated at the museum, the formation of the 99th Pursuit Squadron. And you ask people if they ever heard of the 99th Pursuit Squadron, and actually the answer is no. You ask them if they've heard of the Tuskegee Airmen, and most people have. Of course, that whole project was an experiment that the Army Air Corps and the Department of War hoped would fail. So they figured that they would require the maintenance people to, to be trained first here at Chinook Field. And so we had 255 enlisted and six uh, officer candidates go through training here to learn aircraft maintenance, engines, sheet metal, electronics, uh, uh, avionics, and everything like that, with the idea that they'd fail the establishment could say, see, we told you so, end of discussion. Well, not only did they pass and succeed, they set the highest grade point average in the history of the schoolhouse. Uh, very significant because that success and that dedication carried forward successfully then to the Tuskegee Airmen and to their activities and beyond. But the stars of the museum are the airplanes, planes of all types and all ages. They were all here uh, at one time and used either in static display in, in a training uh, base. You all have these kind of things to keep the kids all pumped up and everything else like that. But other of the aircraft were used as training aids in the various classes. And when the Air Force left, Rantoul decided they had to keep the stories of these machines and the people who flew them alive. When we got them, the airplane were in pretty good condition. However, uh, we have limited space indoors to keep uh, aircraft, and uh, the size of the doorways to bring them through is, is quite small, so we can't get very many aircraft inside. And consequently, the Illinois weather is not kind to those kind of things. And everyone thinks, well, yeah, the snow and the sleet and the rain. Well, it's not that as bad as it is the, the sun and the humidity that causes more damage to the aircraft appearance. The, the term restoration is probably a misnomer. We're more into the conservation or preservation mode. Uh, we're trying to preserve these aircraft at the moment so they don't get any worse than they are. Every Wednesday, several volunteers show up from all over the area to work on these magnificent airplanes. We have uh, a dedicated group of volunteers. These people are not the ones that just go out, okay, we're just going to sand off the, the old paint and put on new paint. These are the ones that know that you have to do it properly, you have to inspect it from the inside out, looking for corrosion to see if there's damage to the, inherent damage to the, the sheet metal that would cause a problem later on so that when we do put the paint job on it, it will last and will survive. Uh, our goal is to restore 
every one of them. It may take us 100 years to do it, but that is our goal, to restore them to uh, the proper condition and the way that they should be displayed. It takes thousands of hours of meticulous work for these volunteers to clean up and repair the planes. But to these men and women, it's not just the machines that they are preserving. They're all airplanes, they all deserve a spot, and they all have a story. And each airplane, in addition to the story of the airplane, uh, also has a story about the people. And that includes the people that flew them, the people that maintained them, and uh, the people like us that are trying to make them look as good as they can and keep them in the shape that they'll, uh, they'll be around for the next generation. Want more information on the story you've just seen? Head to our website at weiu.net slash hh. Check out our online episode gallery for past and present shows. Send us an email or find out how to contact the people and places we feature in the show. That's weiu.net slash hh. Not far from Rantoul is Champaign-Urbana where we met this next group. Now, whether you call them hobbyists or enthusiasts, it doesn't really matter. They're just in it for the fun. Get ready to blast off with CIA in five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. <laughs> Beautiful. This is just a typical day of rocket launching for the CIA. No, not the government group. In this case, CIA stands for Central Illinois Aerospace, a Champaign-Urbana-based group that specializes in model rocketry. One, ignition. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know much about model rocketry, so while we watch this rocket return to Earth from its staggeringly high flight, I'll let someone who does know some more about them fill us in. Model rocketry has been around for about 50 years, and it was developed in part because in the 50s, uh, with the space program and everything, and, the, and Sputnik and all that, um, kids and people, and kids in general, or in, in particular, were getting interested in trying to build rockets, and so they were building their own motors. And that was not a safe thing to be doing. Um, and so one of the reasons for the development of model rocketry as a hobby was some people said, hey, these kids want to go out and fly stuff, can we manufacture motors in a safe and controlled you know, environment that they can then purchase and use safely. And so that's a big part of where the NAR, the National Association of Rocketry, and groups like ours came from, is that they came up with a, you know, commercially manufactured motors which would be reliable and safe, um, a safety code that you could, you know, if you follow this, you'll be safe. And CIA, which was established in 1992, prides itself on being just that. Affiliated with the Champaign Park District, they also follow the guidelines of the National Association of Rocketry and the Tripoli Rocketry Association. We do rockets that are, for the most part, ones that you can buy kits and build. Um, one of the things that makes um, uh, distinguishes model rocketry versus, you know, amateur rocketry, perhaps, you'd call it, or experimental, is that all of the motors we use are commercially manufactured and have been certified. That is to say, they've been tested and found to be reliable and, um, you know, proven to work correctly. The group, one of the largest model rocket groups in Illinois, passes on the safety and the fun through several of their outreach initiatives, part of what makes them unique. Two, one, zero. There are groups similar to ours all over the country. Um, I think we have some, some nice things that we do, such as working with the University of Illinois' aerospace department. Uh, they have an, introduction, an introductory aerospace class for freshmen that, they, that meets in the fall and we help them out with uh, building and flying some rockets that are fairly good size. They're maybe six feet tall and three inches in diameter and weigh five pounds or so. And they, the, the purpose is for them to build payloads and get out and fly them and collect some data and so do some sort of real aerospace you know, engineering kind of stuff as freshmen so that they'll be interested in, in, you know, and motivated to you know, take the rest of the 
boring classes you know, that they have to take. CIA also works with younger students through a workshop at the Chanute Air Force Base's aviation camp for teens in nearby Rantoul. They learn a lot of things about airplanes and they, they, and amongst the, and, but also other aspects of aviation. And one of the things that we've done for several years now is come out and do a workshop where they build rockets and then go out and fly them. Um, give them a chance to, you know, actually build and fly something. And it's perhaps that sense of accomplishment that has launched adults and kids alike into the hobby of rocketry. It's neat to build something that, you know, basically it's a pile of tubes and bits of wood and some plastic and you put it together and paint it and take it out and, and then it and functions, it does something. It flies and it goes very high sometimes um, and then the parachute comes out and it lands and it's, you know, it, you feel like you've done something. You know, granted it's just a hobby, but you know, you feel like you've accomplished something, you've made something work. And, and it also is sort of a connection to, in a sort of a small way, to space program and science. And, you know, it gets you outside and you get out and you have to run and go and collect your rockets. And that, you know, you get some, get some exercise and some sun and some fresh air. And Not to mention, it doesn't take much to get started. Model rocketry is, well, like most hobbies, you can spend as much or as little as you like. Uh, there are starter kits that are available at uh, most hobby shops for 25 bucks. You can get a, a, a rocket kit, some motors, and a launch pad, you know, uh, everything you need to, to, to go out and fly some rockets. Um, then, of course, there's people who spend a lot of money on them. but. Uh, you don't have to, and we welcome anybody, any age, any size rockets to come and fly at our launches. So you'll see kids flying small rockets and then, you know, other people flying bigger ones as well. Guys, I think we straightened zero. The club schedules a few launches a month, but has their biggest event once a year in the summer. A couple of things about how we operate um, during Garlo. We We sort of started this club by having a big launch around the 4th of July. And that, when we started the club, we decided, well, we should keep doing that. And so every year around the 4th of July, we have a big, our big annual launch, uh, which we call the great annual rocket launch of and then the year, so Garlo 2009. And we go and Generally, you have it out of the Dodds Park, um, and uh, it's pretty much a all-day thing. Starts in the 10 o'clock in the morning and goes until uh, late afternoon. And uh, a lot of people come out and uh, fly rockets. We usually have 100 or so rockets flying, and a lot of spectators as well. People come out and watch and make a day of it and bring the family. And after all that excitement, if you want to keep the adrenaline pumping and learn more about rocketry or CIA, just go to their website at ciarocketry.org. And that one is perilously, perilously hard. Will Heartland Highways ever run out of story ideas? Not if you keep sending them our way. Some of our favorite stories were suggestions from viewers like you. Send us your idea either by email, phone, or by sending us a letter. Help us make every mile an adventure. That's all the time we have for this week's show coming to you from O'Brien Field at Eastern. Now, if you're ever on campus, make sure to stop by and see the field for yourself or take a walk and just enjoy the campus gardens. You won't be disappointed. We'll see you next time. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by Consolidated Communications, offering customers high-speed internet, phone service, and digital TV service packages that include high-definition channels, DVR, and hundreds of sports, movies, and music channels. More information on these services available at Consolidated.com. Three, two, one. For this week's show, we're coming to Sorry, I was looking at myself. <laughs> And I, I know, I know. Like, ooh, look at me. <laughs> Do one more. Rantoul came out kind of fun. Rantoul did. Okay. So I'm kind of Rantoul. Wanna just I'm a hillbilly. I can't help it. Yeah. Hick. <laughs> <laughs> now, while it's quiet here today, on game day, the. Oh, no. 
<laughs> no one, it's quieter today. And NFL coaches Mike Childress, something Shanahan, and something Peyton. Not far from, I forgot where Rantoul was, okay. Three, three two, <laughs> yeah, one. one. One's, one's after two when you're going backwards. That's... Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Good. <laughs> I don't know. Just yickety yak about. Okay, come on. I can yickety yak. I'm Say hi to Rich. Stop in his office. He loves you. He loves you. <laughs> he has Rich time loves for you. visitors. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week from O'Brien Field. Sorry. Hey, you started talking. Shut up. <laughs> shut up, shut up.